afternoon. My name is Hamle Labastida. Um, I am from Cuba. I'm honored to be here. In September 2021, I was released from prison in Cuba after I signed a doc statement with my condition of release. I agree that I would stay in silence, that I would not talk about the Cuban government or about my time in prison, but I am today here to tell you everything. I grew up in Cuba in the 90s, and unlike previous generations, we never romanticized the Cuban generation, the Cuban revolution, because we could see it for what it was, what it really was, despotism and brutal corruption. Fidel Castro will always say that we are his family, but as a kid, I was like, okay, we are your family, but where, where is the food? Why didn't you provide to us? We stood in long lines to buy bread. There was no meat, no oil, no moral valors. We thought that it would be short term. No, 93 passed, then 1994, 1995, 1996, 1997. That's when the Cuban people really lost hope with their government. We live in the West Coast. I live in the West Coast, small town called Santa Fe. And we could pick up some FM radio station from the US. It is how somehow I learn English. But it's also the first time I heard Cuban exiles talking critically about Cuba. That it was another Cuba, another vision, and another history. Inside Cuba, we understand what was happening, but we never talk ab about it. It was too dangerous to speak it, speak it out loud. Even when we saw thousands of people living in Raf in August of 1994. In 1998, I began studying at the Academy of Fine Art in Havana. Then I started doing research on Cuban and Russian propaganda. I started noticing that the people who disappeared from Cuban history books, books the names no longer listed in the caption, the face missing from a st strategically edited photo. The revolution has a way of devouring his own children, as we can say. Revoluciones como Saturno devoran a sus propios hijos. Political propaganda and censorship are so natural to the Cuban experience that we don't even think about it. And that's why I decided to use their own propaganda against their, that propaganda in my artistic practice. But I knew that my art will not be welcome in the country. So as my career grew up, grew, my, re, my career grew up, I repeatedly left the country for residencies and exhibition. I knew as early as 2003 that the Cuban authorities were so building me. These authorities are the Departamento de Seguridad del Estado, the State Security Department. Cuban artists and their supporters have faced intimidation and attacks by the authorities for years. But in 2018, the government issued the Decree 349, a new law that prohibited all artistic artists from operating in public or private space without prior approval for, by the Ministry of Culture. You could not hire an artist without the government blessing. An artist could not sell their work without permission either. In other words, they legalized censorship. More than that, they legalized cultural violence and repression. And we were going to stand for that. The San Isidro movement was born to revoke the Decree 349. That's how everything started. For two years, our community of activists and artists grew. When rapper and artist Denis Solis was arrested in 2020, a group of artists went on a hunger strike for the Movimiento de San Isidro. The police surrounded the internet and arrest them. The next day, the 27N group was born, 27 of November, 27 de noviembre, demanding that the government, to the government and the cultural officials stop repression and censorship. In, our, in April of 2021, we wrote and signed the manifesto saying that we want to live in a country that is inclusive, democratic, democratic sovereign and prosperous, equitable and transnational. And we demand political freedoms, economic freedoms, the legalization of independent media, the right to assembly, the right to collective organization, political participation. That same month, I devoted a solo exhibition at Kunsthaus Betanien Gallery in Berlin that consisted of two large scale installations of paper cutouts on what it was a massive transcript of the police integration of a Cuban photographer and artist, Javier Caso, in 2020. One was a letter written by the Cuban poet Alberto Padilla in 1971 after a brutal 39 days of imprisonment where he was forced to denounce his own war as a counter-revolutionary and also himself as a traitor. 
They were exactly 50 years apart, and yet it seems like nothing had changed. When I returned to Cuba on June of 21st, they sent me to a quarantine center for five days. Even though I was vaccinated and had a negative COVID test, then I was arrested immediately and sent to Villa Marista prison, same prison in where Alberto Padilla was psychologically tortured in 1971. They accused me of instigating to commit a crime because an idea that I shared with the 27N group to stamp some currency with logo for San Isidro movement and 27N group. That idea never happened, but I was arrested just for thinking it, for thinking it and just for saying it. For the next few weeks, they interrogated me every single day. Then, on July 11, thousands of Cubans took to the streets to protest because they wanted the freedom. It was the largest demonstration that Cuba had ever seen. After that day, word detained thousands of peaceful protesters and charged them with crimes like public disorder, terrorism, sabotage, contempt. Many of them end up in Villa Marista just like me. I saw them. I saw a 16 years old boy, Yanquiel Perez. His name until today is not in any list. He is invisible. After the protesters, after the protesters start, my interrogation escalated. Uh, they escalated their threats, suggesting that I could try it. I will be tried for instigation to a rebellion or sedition, which carry out 15 to 20, to 20 years prison sentence. After the first month, I started to think that I was moving to another prison, that I would never be released. Sometimes I think that I'm still there. When you are an artist, you develop a certain sensibility for sound, music, beauty, horror, and terror. Prison is the worst place for a person, and for an artist, it's even worse. They held me in a small prison cell with the three, three other inmates on the top of the floor of the state, state security headquarters. They never leave you alone because they knew that you could commit suicide. The lies were on the 24 hours a day, a TV in a hallway play Cuban television and propaganda all day long, and you can listen to that TV. You could hear people talking, but you start to lose touch with the reality. You don't know what was real or what was fake. I saw and I hear other prisoners lose their minds too, screaming from other cells. They said something like, Oficial, donde esta mi amigo? Asesino. Me quieren matar, pero no voy a decir nada. Yo no soy un chivato. I heard stuff like that. In interrogation, they tried to force me to confess. First, saying that I was taking order from the U.S. State Department, then that I was being managed by secret agents in Poland, Germany, and Spain, and so on. I refused it. In September, I contracted COVID-19, and I was sent to the prison infirmary. They never notified my family about that or any relative. Then I learned that the police wanted to make a deal with my, with my then partner poet, Catherine Bisquet, for both of us to go to Europe in exile. Dozen of agents escorted us directly to the Jose Marti, kind of very weird VIP area, airport, without saying goodbye to our families. They agreed to extend my Cuban passport for two years, but with a warning. If you continue to criticize or antagonize the Cuban government and you try to return, Villa Marista will Waiting, it will be waiting for you. Today, I live in Germany, and I continue to work for a democratic Cuba, and I believe that is more closer than you think. The reason that the government is acting so strong is that they know they are losing. That soon, that soon an independent tribunal will summon them. Until that day, I will never stop to talking about Cuba and raising awareness with my heart. Today, Cuban society is in horror, but the government also is in panic. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to appear before you today to bring awareness on the ongoing crisis of democracy and human rights in Nicaragua. In 2019, my husband, Felix Maradiaga, stood here on this same stage and say that he saw the seed of hope being planted in Nicaragua. Today, he's in prison, together with more than 180 political prisoners. I'm here to continue his fight 
against the cruelest human rights abuses my country has ever seen in peacetime. I met Felix 22 years ago in my hometown, Ciudad Arillo, near the mountains of Nicaragua. The city is named after the poet Rubén Darío, who's famous for beautiful lines like, si pequeña es la patria, uno grande la sueña. If the homeland is small, one dream is big. Each year, we held a celebration in his honor where the young woman were, of the city will dress up in beautiful clothes to read his poetry, and a panel of judges will vote to decide who is Ruben Darío's muse. In 2000, I was one of the muses, and Felix was a judge. Believe it or not, he gave me the lowest score of any of the judges, but I forget him because otherwise we may not have met. The year after I moved to the capital city to study, I was the first woman in my family to go to the university, and I was there on a scholarship studying business economics. Soon I got a job at the national TV station as the main anchor of a morning show. And for the next eight years, I was on TV six days a week. I thought I could make an impact in my country by talking about important social issues. Later, I became the general manager of a local TV station and I had a front row seat to the Ortega's regime abuses. The journalists will pitch story ideas about government scandals and corruption, and afterwards we would be told to let others to publish the news or not to publish some content. The government censored us again and again. I felt horrible. I felt like I was being complicit with Ortega. By 2016, Felix and I were both well known around the country. I, for my reporting in Felix for his human rights and advocacy work. That year, the Independent Liberty Party nominated me to represent Managua in the National Assembly as part of the National Coalition for Democracy. I never thought about getting into politics, but I accepted their offer and resigned from the TV station. But before the election took place, Ortega's loyalists and the Nicaraguan Supreme Court disqualified our political party from the elections. By the end of that year, Daniel Ortega had installed his wife as the vice president of Nicaragua. As a dictator, uh, I'm sorry, as the director of the Institute of Strategic Studies and Public Policy, Felix investigated rump corruption and worked to strengthen civil society organizations. In April of 2018, Ortega announced reform to the social security system with lower pensions from the early. Across the country, people took to the street to protest. The police responded by violently attacking peaceful protesters. After 30 days, they had killed 63 people, mostly students. According to the autopsy report, most of them were shot in the chest, neck, and head. As prominent members of the opposition, I knew our lives were at risk. So Felix and I made the impossible decision to take our five-year-old daughter and his mother to the U.S. Felix stayed behind in Nicaragua to continue his work in polit politician activism. Ortega's supporters found Felix and beat him so severely that he was hospitalized. And after he testified at the U.N. Security Council in New York about Ortega Ortega's abuse in Nicaragua, the regime issued a warrant for his arrest, accusing him of organized crime and financing terrorism. I asked him to leave the country, so he came with us to the U.S. temporarily. In 2019, he went back to Nicaragua to work in the effort to unite the opposition and strengthen the blue and white national unity movement, one of the main opposition groups in the country. Felix was put under 24 hours police surveillance. He received contest threats and was not always allowed to leave his house. In February 2021, 
Felix announced that he was running for president in the November election. We knew it was a huge risk. And on June 8, last year, Felix was disappeared by the Ortega's regime. The police put his car over, they bit him and took him away. For 84 days, I have no idea where my husband was. I didn't even know if he was alive. Then, in August, we found out that he was in El Chipote prison, along with more than 40 other opposition leaders, including five other presidential candidates, plus journalists, students, peasants, party leaders, human rights defenders, and business people. Even former heroes of the Sandinistas Revolution, like Hugo Torres Jimenez, a retired brigadier, brig, brigadier general, who tragically died at a hospital under police custody after eight months in prison. The conditions they are held are truly horrific. They sleep in concrete slabs without sheets or blankets, they are verbally abused and psychologically tortured. They do not have access to reading material, not even a Bible. Felix has always been an athletic person. He practiced martial arts. He run 100 kilometer races. He's one of the youngest people in prison, but he's lost 50 pounds and he's painfully skinny. Roger Reyes, Felix's lawyer who was also later arrested, begged the, the guards for Psychiatry, psychiatry treatment when he started losing his memory. He can't even remember the names of his daughter and he's just 38 years old. Other prisoners like Tamara Davila, Ana Margarita Vigil, Dora Maria Telles, and Suyen Barahona have been held in solidary confinement for almost 10 months. Prisoners in other jails like Jaime Navarrete, Marvin Vargas, Edward Lacayo, I've also been in the similar conditions since 2018 when the protest started, and we believe their lives are in risk. Ortega has banned all independent political parties. He has arrested journalists, shut down media organizations. Today, Nicaragua, like Cuba, is one of the countries in the Americas that don't even have a print newspaper. With the help of authoritarian regime like China, Russia, and Venezuela, Ortega and his family controls the economy, and they amass an enormous fortune. Meanwhile, our citizens live in poverty, and more than 200,000 Nicaraguan have been fleeing the country, desperately seeking for safety and jobs. Along with Victoria Cárdenas, the wife of political prisoner Juan Sebastián Chamorro, I have been speaking out and demanding freedom for all political prisoners. The regime has condemned us as traitor of the homeland. So I haven't been, I haven't been able to see Felix the last two years. And because I cannot go back to Nicaragua, I haven't had any contact with him since he was arrested in June 8th last year. The regime will not allow Felix to receive a phone call, a letter, or even a drawing of our eight-year-old daughter. Recently, Felix and others were sentenced between eight to 13 years in prison in a trial held not in a courtroom, but in the prison violating all due process. But I know what my husband will say if he were here, that despite everything, he believes in democracy. And he believes that the answer to Ortega's violence is nonviolence, and that we must persevere. In the last visit, Felix sent me a message with his sister. The fight for the defense of human rights, rights does not have borders, he said. From the prison where I, I've been tortured, I ask for the world's solidarity with Nicaragua. I ask that you do not forget all the children growing up without parents and the millions of Nicaraguans suffering under this regime. So I ask you, if you would like to show your support, you can sign a public letter to Daniel Ortega in the page cehumanonicaragua.com. 
Before he was arrested, Felix called Alejandra, our daughter, every night to talk and play. Days before he was captured, he sent me many short videos on WhatsApp and told me to play them for Alejandra if she becomes sad. He recorded a video for her birthday and another for Christmas. He also made a video for me and he say, I miss you, I love you, and I'm not there today, but I will be there soon. Every time Alejandra and I cry, we take out those videos and we listen to his voice. I know our family will be reunited one day and I know Ortega regime will fall. The future of democracy in Nicaragua is coming soon and we will not stop fighting until we can raise this flag again in the street and not be taken into prison or killed for it. Viva Nicaragua Libre! Good afternoon. In May 2015, I was in Israel with my wife when I got a call from my lawyer. Do not come back to Venezuela. He said, they will arrest you immediately. I figured it would be over soon. And in just a few days, I would be able to go back home. I was wrong. It has been six years now. Today, I live in exile in Spain, and I run the Venezuela's largest independent newspaper, although I do it remotely. El Nacional was founded in 1943 by my father, a journalist, and my grandfather, an entrepreneur. We have always been a newspaper that complies with truthfully reporting. We do it now, and we also did it in the past. However, when Hugo Chavez first ran for president in 1998, we backed him because he represented a possible change for good. He won the elections cleanly. I met with him numerous times, and at first, it didn't seem to be terribly wrong. He was charismatic, a great communicator. He defended, at least rhetorically, our right to free speech and promised a liberal democratic program along the lines of Tony Blair's humanistic capitalism. But by 2001, Chavez showed his true colors. He was obsessed with staying in power, and he lashed out at anyone who challenged him. He used his Sunday TV show, Hello President, to attack the media and journalists, including me personally. The last time I spoke to him was a phone call about an article we had published. He insisted that the report where we refer the murder by police of innocent people was a lie. I stood my ground and told him that if he wanted to talk to the reporter, he could. Then I handed the woman's reporter the phone and she agreed to take Chavez to their graves. But he, he did not change his mind. After the 2002 coup attempt against him, he put new exchange controls in place, which skyrocketed the price of paper. This, the price we should pay for a ton of newsprint was 30 or 40 times what an official newspaper had to pay. Most newspapers did not survive under these conditions. Luckily, in our case, publishers in other countries came to our rescue we received shipments of paper from Mexico, from Bogota, from Costa Rica, from Uruguay, Puerto Rico, Brazil, Peru, Panama, Argentina, Ecuador, and Chile. Great newspapers of the continent sent newsprint to keep printing. And we kept publishing for a couple of years. Even when our journalists were harassed, even when they threw rocks at our building, even when one of Chavez's supporters set off a bomb outside the office, outside our office, 
The bomber was arrested, but released a day later without charges. Chavez knew that to stay in power, he needed to follow Cuba's model. So he caused it up to Fidel Castro and called for a communication hegemony. His strength is tied with China, Iran, Cuba, and he made a 2.5 million arms deals with Russia. He also accepted criminal groups, the FARC, the ELN, guerrilla, Colombian guerrillas, Hezbollah, building the authoritarian model that rules Venezuela. In 2007, I knew things were becoming really bad. Chavez shut down Radio Caracas Television. At that time, television. At that time, it was Venezuela's largest independent TV station with 10 million viewers, near half of the country's population. Thousands of protesters, protesters took the streets, but it didn't matter. In its place, Chavez administration launched the next day their own new propaganda TV channel with the infrastructure of Radio Caracas TV. In a few years, Chavez regime effectively destroyed independent TV and radio. And while Venezuelans were starving to death, he used state money to buy up media outlets. A year before his death, his administration asked me to sell them the paper, and I refused. We were the only important newspaper that refused to sell itself to the government. In 2013, Chavez died, and the foreign minister, Maduro, took over. It was the Cubans who appointed him. By then, Venezuela no longer had an independent judicial system. The judge became servants of the executive power, where all the acts and decisions obey instructions of the regime. It was in 2015 that we republished an article for, from ABC, the Spain newspaper, about Diosdado Cabello, a high-ranking military lieutenant colonel and the president of the National Assembly. The article reported that the U.S. government was investigating Cabello for trafficking cocaine in coordination with the FARC, Colombia's guerrilla army. And yes, all of this was true. If you go to the United States State Department website right now, you will see a 10 million reward for information leading to his arrest. But it doesn't matter what is true or not under Maduro's reign. Cabello sued our newspaper and two other media for a slander. And it was then that I received a call from my lawyer. Don't come back to Venezuela. I was shocked. But I never once doubt our decision to publish. And I never once considered stopping. So I continued to run the newspaper from exile. And in 2017, the Venezuelan judge reached a decision. We owe Cabello $1 million. Yes, $1 million. But with the country's hyperinflation, that amounted to about $12,000. Cabello was not happy with that decision either. He ordered, ordered the Supreme Court to open a new trial. They changed the verdict from $12,000 to $13 million. We asked them to justify that number. They couldn't. So the Venezuelan army stormed our building and removed every last person inside. They say the building belonged to Cabello now. It was part of his repayment. Luckily, our reporters were already accustomed to work from home at this, at, this, at this point during the pandemic. All our servers were offshore. We stopped printing physical papers in 2018 because of the lack of newsprint. So everything is online. Our servers are in the US, and our journalists can continue their work no matter what Maduro tries against us. However, the harassment of reporters has been terrible. 
They physically assault them, steal their work tools, threaten them, arrest them. Only the brave and daring ones are willing to work as journalists knowing the risk they run. In February 2022, the government blocked our website and our Venezuelan readership dropped to nothing. However, we tried to teach our readers on how to use a VPN to evade the internet service provider. I am proud of the work we have done and the work we will continue to do at El Nacional. Chavez and Maduro have tried everything they could to destroy independent journalists, but we'll, we will not let it happen. They have destroyed our country. It's like a war. The suffering of Venezuelans defies any description. They have driven six million people to leave the country, one-fifth of the population of Venezuela. They have destroyed our economy. They have let our people starve. Today, 95% of the population lives in extreme poverty. The average Venezuelan family lives on $20 per month. Not per hour, not per day, per month. 66 cents a day. And repression is a constant in that government, in that regime. For too long, we Venezuelans look at other countries and we used to say, Venezuela is not Cuba. What happened to them cannot happen to us. But it did happen. Perhaps you think the same now. You listen to my story and say, what happened to Venezuela we will, never, will never happen to us. But I'm telling you, it can. Right now, several Latin American countries are courting politicians just like Chavez. Chile, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Argentina, and Honduras. Do not take freedom for granted. Our country is on the brink of collapse. It could explode at any moment. But I believe when it does, democracy will prevail. And then I will be on the first flight back to my country, back to my children, back to my grandchildren, I only know them by Skype, and back to my people. That day, the headlines of El Nacional will read, Venezuela returns to democracy. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you for sharing your stories. You know, it's interesting to uh, see the similarities between them. All of these leaders trying to silence a free press, any kind of political opposition, any kind of freedom of speech. But the other similar thing between all of these three countries, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, is the support of Russia, Iran, China, these three countries. Do you think, Miguel, the West needs to do more to unite against all of these countries so that they can promote democracy everywhere? Well, the, 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 the problem with Venezuela is a very dramatic problem because uh, the, 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 uh, Venezuela is, a, is a, a corporation of evil. Everything is illegal. When they have an alliance with FARC, ELN, they, they give these people this Colombian guerrilla land, part of the, of the country. They, they work with the Iranians for illegal extraction of gold. C Cubans uh, own our intelligence department. I mean, the military intelligence is run by the Cubans. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not a normal uh, relationship with all these countries. It's an alliance wh which make these countries uh, work inside Venezuela with, with the with Chavista people. So is, uh, wh how can we make uh, the, the world understand that this is a problem for their security? I mean, all the cocaine that, that comes to Europe comes from Venezuela, not, not by the cartels. It's the government who works with the Cuban guerrillas and it's the government who make the commercialization of the cocaine in Europe. They have training camps of Hezbollah. I mean, the, 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 the situation of Venezuela, 
the reality of Venezuela is very, very, very complicated. And I don't know why the international community don't, don't take this as, a, as an important issue for security of, of the, the, the rest of the world. Well, when the Western uh, countries do unite, and they try and do something. So for example, in the case of Nicaragua, as we've just seen, there were elections there which have been condemned. The answer from Daniel Ortega is it's the West trying to impose their will on a country. And if a country wants to change, it needs to come from within. So what do you say to that, Berta, about Nicaragua? Um, I believe that the change have to come within the country because it reflects the willing of the people. And in the case of Nicaragua, we have tried to do our best to have this change in the country. And you can see it in 2018 when the protest um, started, it started very spontaneously. That year we have more than 350 people killed by the regime. So these people gave their lives for, for this transformation to happen in Nicaragua. But we are fighting against a regime that controls the police, the militaries, and they also have paramilitaries. And we have a, a civilians trying to fight with rocks or, you know, their voices. So it's really impossible to, to fight against this repression, this level of repression. I mean, we can see in the last elections, Seven of the 10 presidential candidates in the country are in prison right now. So we couldn't make this transition to democracy in a peaceful way um, through elections. Um, so right now we believe that the international community is the only way to go in order to press the regime to make a change. And when I say press the regime, it's like Daniel Ortega and his regime have to be accountable for all the violations that ha they have committed. So there's where the international community can help us and, and can um, enforce the Nicaraguan people that is seeking democracy and freedom to do their, their work within the country. Well, you, right now we're seeing the West unite, you know, very much against Russia in terms of the, the war that obviously it's a different situation, Russia's aggression in Ukraine. But the sanctions that they've placed on Russia are obviously having an effect on all of Russia's relationships. When it comes to Cuba, who obviously has very close ties with Russia, we're already seeing in Cuba that there's a shortage of food. We're seeing that the sanctions on some of the Russian public and the travel ban is having an effect on tourism in Cuba. Hamlet, do you see this as a potential opening for democracy within the country? I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry, the intention of what? The, the, the trickle down of the, the sanctions on Russia that are having an effect on Cuba. Do you think that this could lead to maybe an opening of democracy following the protests we saw in Cuba from the people last year? I mean, it's very complex because at the same time, the Cuban government has an inc inc incredible experience dealing with sanctions and also how overpassing. So this is one thing, but already we have uh, certain sanctions with the United States uh, towards Cuba. And uh, regarding to the Russian uh, sanctions and how it could affect uh, Cuba, well, now there is no, uh, there, is, there are some reports that there is no, basically no more traveling from Russia to Cuba because uh, some, uh, the aeroflow that is operating to Cuba is not going anymore there. And also, lack of, uh, of food. I think the Russian also w it will be a huge impact on that. And um, of course, there is going to be uh, some situation there, especially in the military, uh, the military groups that they basically are uh, receiving everything from, from Russia, um, but also the society, unfortunately. But I think that the situation in Cuba is that they will try to manage that because the Cuban government, they never care about if the country, that the people is suffering or not. And they uh, to do like a, um, in their image, they always are trying to say that they basically is because sanctions, but at, at the end, they receive uh, a lot of goods from those countries. Uh, what I can tell you is by my personal experience, I know when I was in that prison, that the militaries, they have a lot of resources, but the people not. 
So basically, there are like a two societies or two hierarchies. You see that society of military or this, you know, kind of apparatchis uh, uh, that they have a nice life, but the human society no, and they put the blame on the uh, f uh, on the rest of the world. But I mean, the situation is so complex because we are dealing with 63 years of how they can wash their image. It's so complex. They are dealing with the situations like that and also like a double image that they were playing. The Cuban government uh, also know how to deflate those things. But we are waiting just a generational change because historic, uh, what they call it, the Generación Historica still in power. So yes, it will affect, but... It may affect the people more. Mm, yes, yes. Um, you know, talking about the people, Miguel, you mentioned how many Venezuelans have left the country. We're seeing an interesting phenomenon with the people that have left. And obviously, you know, I can't speak for all of them, but we are seeing that many of them don't vote for democratic candidates in the countries that they go to. They tend to vote for the strongmen. Do you think people in Venezuela have just given up in their belief in democracy? Or why do you think we're seeing this? Well, when they vote for Chavez, Chavez was not a, was not a strong man. He wasn't democratic. I mean, people vote for democracy. Our people is democratic. Uh, sometimes there are a lot of problems and people believe they need something strong, but democratic. Right now, of course, it's a different situation. So anything that changes Venezuela, everybody will go after them. It's, it's a it's a coup or a democratic election, whatever happens. But our people is democratic. I mean, we have been like that all the time. The, the problem with that, I'll tell you what is the problem, is that, that uh, Occident, I mean, the, the international democratic community, believes that a, a, a situation uh, as, as Venezuela, you have to dialogue with them, and they have the mentality of democracy. And this is a criminal corporation. There have been six dialogues, one in Republica Dominicana, one in Bahamas, one in Mexico. Nothing happens because it's, it's, they won't go out on a dialogue. They, they won't accept a democratic election. They will do anything to stay, stay in power, anything, because they know that the moment they leave power, they will go into jail. By, by the United States, the, the DEA, by anything. I mean, they, 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 the only way you can take them out is, uh, is in a sort of, of uh, upheaval, uh, something more violent. They will leave power like a like democratic world believes they will, not, they will give power. Well, it's, it's a very sad situation to see what's happened in Venezuela, and it's a bad situation that's just got worse. Um, but just quickly, can you talk to me a little bit about the personal toll? You know, you are uh, separated from your husband, you have a child, all three of you are separated from your countries. I mean, none of this is easy, but um, how do you keep yourself optimistic? Well, that's, that's kind of hard sometimes. Um, I relate to my spiritual life with um, where I get its strength every time I fail that you know, there's no hope. Um, so faith for me, it's been very important. And from my, what I heard from, from Felix, it's, it's also the same inside when you don't have anything to relay with. But then being a mother and a wife with this situation, it's, it's really hard because I have to take care of Alejandra and Felix's mother in the U.S. I also have to do international advocacy for my husband and the rest of the political prisoners. And then I have to find how to sustain ourselves economically, not only in the U.S., but also in Nicaragua because, you know, there are other things to expenses to pay there. So it's really hard, and in particularly in our culture where men are seen as the providers, you know. when. Felix was with us, he was helping me with a lot of these expenses, but now I'm in myself. So um, thanks God there are people that have been very um, helpful to me, but still it's a huge responsibility to get from one day to the other. And the other part that is really hard as a mother is to see how my daughter is struggling. And recently we ended receiving 
psychiatry treatment because she entered in this kind of anxiety and depression for, for his father. And seeing that and dealing with that, it's, it was very hard. And sometimes I find myself saying, you know what, I think my daughter is more important than anything else. Um, but then you realize that you do what you do because of them, because we hope to leave to them a better place, a better country where she can get all the opportunities that she deserves and all the Nicaraguan people deserve. So, so just to conclude, uh, meeting people like the one that we met at this summit, every one of you uh, that are fighting for human rights, people that cares about human rights and the situation of dignity in, in the world is just energizing. So I hope that we can come together just like all these dictators are working together to really put in the world, um, to make the world a better place for everyone. So I know we're out of time, so I'm just gonna ask one final question. Hamlet, you spoke about the um, unprecedented protest that took place in Cuba last year in July. And this really was something that the country's never seen before. Does this make you optimistic that change could happen in your lifetime? Because just before you said it sometimes takes like generational change. Yes, because it was the first time that something like that happened in the Cuban history. Some people try to think that it was something there, but no, 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 it's unprecedented. It's not unprecedented in decades. It's the first time that something like that happened. And in a, I mean, in a stero stereographical way. So it made me, it made me to, to, to find hope in the, in, the, in, in the Cuban society, because can you think that after 63 years of elaborate and you know sophisticated brainwash schools, you know the Cuban government have make emphasis in, in that, make emphasis in the, in the political culture of Sovietism somehow, and make emphasis in in the in, in that doctrine, that at the end, if you saw thousands of people in the whole island, you know, asking for freedom. And also freedom, as I mentioned many times, has a surname, you know. When we said freedom, when we said libertad, it's not just a structural thing, it's just libertad politica. It's just plain like that. In Cuba, it's like that. So after seeing that, after seeing how powerful they are with this indoctrination system and also in intelligence, do you know, victims of this art, Venezuela and Nicaraguan and so on and so forth, and half of Latin American, uh, and you see the people raising and gaining political conscience about what they want, you understand that this sleep cell is awakening in the Cuban. So we have that DNA, the SADN, how we say in Spanish, of uh, freedom, democracy, liberty, republicanism, and um, basically basic uh, fundaments of human rights and, and civic duties that are the same in, in London, in New York, or I don't know, in, in, here in Geneva. So this really bring you hope. It bring you hope and also bring hope to them also, I think. Because Cuba, as Rosa Maria was saying yesterday, is like a, basically the front line of these, these people are well prepared and well trained and they have a lot of arm and they have a lot of in, an incredible uh, mechanism and indoctrination and also they have a lot of secrets when they can blackmail all those uh, candidates or those leftists, uh, 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 groups, the political groups that they want to establish in power. So yes, I see hope, and also is this I mentioned it, but this kind of struggle between this um, analogic society that represents the Cuban government, the Cuban historic uh, regeneration of the Cuban government, and this digital. Although that they try to go to this digital space, they don't know how to do it. It's the analogic, so they commit many mistakes. So you know, it's a, ch it's, it's a change of balance. It's a change of People are really tired, and it's weird to see how people are raising and raising again after almost seven decades, how they understand that valors. What happened to them? I think what happened to them is that they understand and they demand and they want democracy. This is what I have to keep optimistic. <laughs> Absolutely, and as you said, you know, they, the, the countries are so intertwined, so once it happens somewhere, then hopefully in one of these countries, the, the rest will follow. Thank you very much for your time. We, uh, we are out of time. We'll have to continue yes. this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.